Good morning. Good morning. Today is Pentecost Sunday. And the word Pentecost in the Bible, the original Greek, it means 50. It's the 50th day after Jesus was resurrected. Pentecost. And for many, this is going to be a marker day. And so I want to get right into the word. In the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, it shows us that the disciples were assembled together with Jesus and he commanded them before he left himself he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but that they should wait for the promise of the Father which says he you've heard of me for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now notice, he commanded them. It wasn't a choice. He didn't say, you know, perhaps you should stay in Jerusalem. He didn't say, I suggest you stay in Jerusalem. He didn't say, if you want to, you could stay in Jerusalem. He commanded them to stay in Jerusalem. And this is what we need to understand today. Obedience. Obedience. That one word I need you to grab a hold of today for too many it's a bad word. But for the one who wants to be used in this hour, in the power and the might of the Lord, obedience is going to be their best friend. It's going to be paramount. So here they were together. And I'm not going to dwell on that. But they were assembled together. And we're going to see how they were in one accord. And that's also important. But for the individual, we must hear God's commands. He commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem. And there was a purpose. And there was a reason. Jerusalem is a very important location to God. It's the capital of his city, but it's the place where he's going to set up his earthly kingdom in the end when he comes to take over this earth back from us because we've messed it up. So, what was getting ready to take place at this time that he was speaking to them had to happen in Jerusalem. It had to happen in Jerusalem. So he told them, he commanded them, do not depart from Jerusalem. And the second thing he told them is to wait, wait. Obedience. Obedience. And let me tell you, the political and social climate at that time in Jerusalem was chaotic. It was not good, especially for them. 
because they were hated by the Jewish community, the, the Jewish elders, especially the ones who were supposed to be the religious leaders representing God, they were after this group of people who loved Jesus. So for them to stay in Jerusalem was not easy. But I want to tell you something. Obedience to God's command must always win over something that's hard. Matthew Henry, when I checked it out, reported that they came to Jerusalem according to their master's appointment, though there they were in the midst of enemies. But it should seem that though immediately after Christ's resurrection, they were watched and were in fear of the Jews. So it wasn't a pleasant place for them to be. But you've got to understand in this hour and for them, greater was Christ who would soon be in them like he is in us. Greater was Christ than the enemy creating havoc in Jerusalem with his diabolical plans which we see him doing now obedience on this day this pentecost sunday i want to tell you the secret of seeing god's miracles of seeing a harvest of souls let's go to john chapter 16 john chapter 16 in verse 16, Jesus told his disciples, he says, in a little while, you will not see me. And then again, in a little while, you shall see me because I go to the Father. And they didn't understand what he meant. And if you go down, you can see the whole discourse about what he meant in a little while. But we, looking back, can see what he meant. In a little while, they would kill him. They would crucify him. They would murder him. He would allow them to murder him for us. To pay the price for our faults, our sin against God. In a little while. But in a little while, three days, three nights later, he will raise again from the dead. And then, in a little while, 50 days later, he would send the powerhouse, the Holy Spirit, in a little while. Looking at verse 7 in John 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. He always speaks truth because he is truth. Nevertheless. I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. It's expedient. Greek, sumphero, expedient. It's profitable for you, even though it seems sad for a while that I go away. Verse 8, when he comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Three things the Holy Spirit will do. He'll reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. 
sin for those who do not believe in him, so they're living for the devil. Righteousness? Because he's going to his father. Because he's going to his father, all the things that he accomplished when he said it is finished makes it possible for us with the Holy Spirit's empowerment and the information, the knowledge in this word makes it possible for us to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus made it possible. And of judgment, of judgment, the prince of this world is judged. Let me tell you this, the prince of this world, Satan, with all his diabolical plans, we see it right now, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, I would have never dreamt to see what I'm seeing in the American society and political arena now. I would have never dreamt that it could happen. But we've been warned, and it's happened, and there's worse to come. There's worse to come, but there's better for those who choose Christ. He said in verse 12 of John 16, he said, I have many things to say to you. But you cannot bear them now. And that's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. And that's the beauty of this Bible. He said in verse 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, notice, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. Because he's the third part of the Godhead. Notice what he will do. He will guide you into all truth. Do you want truth? Or do you want to live a lie? It's a choice right now. And I love this part. It says he will not speak of himself, but whatever he hears, he'll speak. But look look what else it says in the last phrase in 13. He will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit, who was the promise of the Father for everyone who believes in Jesus, for everyone who receives Jesus, the Holy Spirit, who was to come for the first time to live in man and upon man continuously, is the Spirit of truth who speaks all truth, who will show us things to come and remind us of those things Jesus told them, there's much for me to say, but you can't bear it. The Holy Spirit's job is not only to teach it to us, but to bring it to our remembrance. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Holy Spirit. This is the hour when he's pouring out his Holy Spirit afresh upon those who, like the disciples, are poised, ready to receive. This is the hour. And it's marked by the fear of the Lord that leads to obedience, even in the fear, even in the face of evil and threat of death. You obey. You obey. 
And we've got to get to that place. And one of the things I was going to talk about today and I prepared diligently is death. I forgot today was Pentecost. So until this morning at 7 o'clock, I didn't have the correct message. It suddenly dawned on me, oh, my sweet Jesus, it's the day of Pentecost. What is it that you want said today? And I had to listen, and I had to still myself, and I had to hear, and this is what thus says the Lord. If you walk in the fear of the Lord, it will lead you to obedience, even in the face of fear, in the face of evil, in the face of the threat of death. And God has raised up a people. God has raised up a people the last few years and he's raising up a people who recognize and honor his lordship who still themselves to hear his voice like David says I've quieted myself like a child weaned from the breast and there's much in that but what it simply means is that thing that was delicious to me, that was sustainable to me, that was sweet, that I lived off of, I can't live off of it anymore. And now I have got to make myself shift. I have got to make myself shift from drinking the breast to eating meat. God has trained this group of people who were willing to go his way do what he says, to obey him, even when he asks them to do something that may be strange or hard or uncomfortable and definitely laughable to the world. And I'm, and I'm just going to give you one or two examples from the Bible. Now, when God called me, he called me from Ezekiel. And here in Ezekiel 4.12, it's horrifying to see what he told Ezekiel to do. He told Ezekiel to do, in, in Ezekiel 4.12, eat barley cakes and bake them with feces that comes out of man in the sight of all the people. Could you imagine that? But God was so fed up. God was so disgusted and combobulated with the evil that they were doing. He said this about them. That he wanted them to see That this defiled bread that Ezekiel was eating was parallel to the defilement that they were producing. The behaviors they were producing was so abominable, much in the day that we live in. I sometimes think worse, worse. So God told Ezekiel, and Ezekiel responded, thank God for a relationship with God. Ezekiel says, 
But Lord, my soul has not been polluted from my youth until now. I have not eaten anything that's defiled. I have not eaten any abominable flesh in my mouth. So God says, okay, okay. I'll let you not eat it with man's feces. But you'll eat it with cow's feces instead. Strange thing God told him to do. And he obeyed. And you will know it's God because of the relationship that you have with him. The relationship you've been building with him for years. Some of you just for months, but you've been steadfast in finding out who this God is. Who is this God? Daniel calls him when he was referring to him. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, he says, I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. And Daniel's day, it was much like the day when Ezekiel was dealing with the children had corrupted themselves and defiled themselves again. And again, we're living in that day. We're living in that day when everybody seemed to be going their merry ways and they couldn't care less because the devil has made them comfortable in their homes, in their beautiful cars that's so available to them. He's made them comfortable with their beautiful TVs and whatever they've got, and they're okay. They're okay. And they don't see what's going on around them. They don't see that they're evil men who's using the Bible app. To pray sexually on young children, minors. They don't see that the United Nations is proposing that minors have sex with adults, that it's okay. They're not seeing the sex trafficking of our children especially now that there's a war in the Ukraine and there's this Russian hour, the American borders, there are men, there are women, diabolical plans of the enemy who are grabbing children, grabbing, and it's not girls anymore, it's boys and girls. The diabolical plans of the enemy, the perversity has made young boys more palatable to many, more valuable to many sexually than the girls. And so they're grabbing them. And we're so caught up in me, 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 in our beautiful little areas and what's happening to us and our comfort that we're not seeing. Or... We're so caught up in fighting to pay the rent, fighting this and fighting that, that we're not seeing the diabolical plans of the enemy. We're living in a day when God is saying, who will go for me? Who? And so, those 
who fear the Lord, recognizes he's the great and terrible God, who honor him so they obey him regardless. Those are the ones in this hour that he's getting ready to use. I was watching this. I don't know why some things pop up on my YouTube feed. I, I love to look. Mostly I just look at YouTube. And it pops up the the eight greatest um, forces in the world. That's what popped up on my feed yesterday. And I watched it because it was so interesting. It says that the Navy SEAL, American Navy SEAL, is only number six. And they show how mighty they were, and yet they were only number six. But listen, the mighty army, the the heavenly host, the heavenly host, God's army, the ones who do his bidding, the ones who, when they hear his word from our mouth, that army is the greatest force in the entire world. The greatest force in the world. And so in this hour, I was I was trying to look for it so, so I could call the names of these forces like the France G was it something G N it's just mighty men who have gone through this intense training and some of them are secret armies that go out and do reconnaissance but we've got a secret army ready and waiting to hear our voice when the Holy Spirit whispers in our ear and we open our mouth and say what the Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit, think of think of the Holy Spirit as, as our, and he is our advocate, as our power of attorney. God gave us this earth. And so in order for him to operate, he has to work through us because of the laws that are already set up in motion. So, because we in our ignorance have messed this earth up, now we need the wisdom of God. And so he'll speak to those who are open and obedient to him. He'll whisper this great God who sees everything who sees the end from the beginning, he'll whisper to us what to say. And as we stand and say it, think of a child. His mother is standing by, or his big brother is standing by, and he's got to face his enemy. And the brother is whispering to him, or the mother whispering to him what to say, the father whispering to him what to say. And he says it. He's trembling in his boots, but he says it because he knows daddy and mommy, brother, is behind me. And that's the way it is for us right now. A people in this day who, with the Holy Spirit's power and their obedience because of fear of the Lord, will stand in the face of the enemy. People who are living a repentant life, a life of holiness, they're striving for a life of holiness. They're not pulling their zipper down 
every year or every six months boasting about the year and then it, next month they pull it back down. No, they've allowed what they desire to be nothing compared to what God wants and what God desires. And they're marked by three there are more, but these three specific ones I'm going to talk about now. Three specific characteristics about the people that the power of the Holy Ghost will work in concert with in this hour. Number one, their vengeance resistance. Listen, one of those armies one of those secret forces that are in operation right now in the earth, one of the things that they could not do was fight outside of their, whatever their job, um, whatever their assignment is, they could not fight outside of it. That means they couldn't go to a bar and pick a fight. They could not. It was against the policies against the rules another one they could not drink alcohol it was totally against the policies one of the policies one of the characteristics of the army that God has prepared in his human beings submitted to him in this hour is vengeance resistance in other words They choose to obey what God says. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. So when those come against them, they don't go, do you know who I am and, and do whatever back. They don't. Let me show you an example in the Bible. In 2 Samuel chapter 16, David and his men were fleeing because Absalom, his son, had set himself up as king. And so if David didn't flee, he was going to be killed. So here he was. He was fleeing. And it says in 2 Samuel 16, 5, when King David came to Bahurim, Behold, a man of the family of the house of Saul. Hmm, I wonder why the house of Saul. A man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at the... Listen. <laughs> he cast stones at... Listen. And I want you to hear it because... Suddenly, I'm seeing a picture of now. Here was a president dethroned for a moment. And here comes a man who hates him because David took over the throne of his family, Saul, the king. So here comes this man, and he's cursing at the ex, who's not really ex-king. And he's cast, and he dares to cast stones at David and David's servants. He's casting stones at David's mighty men. Mighty men, they were a force to reckon with. They were one of these forces I read about last night. I looked at last night. And so Shimei, when he cursed, he's also shouted, Come out, come out, you bloody man. You man of Belial. What a lie. This is not a man of Belial. This is King David who loves the Lord. He's not a man of Belial. Just because his past is not what you think his past should be and which one of our pasts is the way it should be doesn't mean 
He doesn't serve the Lord. So he's cursing and and throwing stones. And finally, David's mighty man, Abner, he says, why should this dead dog curse my Lord, the king? Let me go over there, I pray you, and take his head off. And sometimes it feels that way. When the enemy is pressing in, you just want to get up there and bash his mouth in. But hear what David says. What shall I do with you, you sons of Zerai? Let him curse. Because the Lord has said unto him, curse David. He understood that the enemy cannot do anything to us unless God give him permission. And God never gives the enemy permission to come against us unless God has a huge plan set in motion. He says, the Lord has said, curse David. So then who shall say, why is he doing it? But I want to tell you something in the end. Shimei was destroyed through David's son. Because David on his deathbed, he told King Solomon, remember Shimei. And King Solomon, in his mercy, said to Shimei, Shimei, you did my father dirty. But I'm not going to kill you. What I'm going to do to you is tell you this. This place where you live, stay there. Stay in that area. Don't ever get out of it. Because the moment that you get out of it, my mercy on you is over and you are going to die. And one day, Shimei's animal, I think it's his, I don't know if it's sheep or his cattle, ran away. And he left the place where he was to go find his animal. And guess what? That was the end of him. So the Bible says, vengeance is mine. Deuteronomy 32, 36. Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come will hasten upon them. Due time. Romans 12, Paul repeated this. He said in Romans chapter 12, verse 17, Repay no evil for evil. Have a regard for good things in the sight of all men, If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So the the group of people that are about to be, and some have already been anointed with fire, anointed by God with the Holy Ghost power in this hour to do his work. One of the things they do not do is take vengeance. And if they even think of it, they repent. They ask God to forgive them. They don't take vengeance. The second characteristic of the people that God is using powerfully in this hour, they have enemy intel. Enemy intel. In other words, they pray for the people enemy, human enemies, but they cast down the spiritual demonic enemies. They know the difference between the two. They know God shed his blood for humans. So that's God's business. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. That's God's business. But they don't have mercy on the demonic. 
They don't have mercy on the demons that are using the people. They know the difference because they obey vengeance is mine. So they have enemy intel. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43, you've heard it said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. You man, you're saying you don't love your wife anymore well you treat her like your enemy because god said love your enemy same with you woman there's no excuse for the shenanigans that you're allowing the enemy to work through you god said what he's put together let no man put asunder and he means it so take authority over those demons that are working against your marriage and stop fighting your spouse. He's not your enemy. She's not your enemy. God said, love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Do good to those who hate you. Why? That you may be children of your father which is in heaven. In other words, that you will have that character that God has. He says, I make the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and I send the rain on the just and the unjust. Enemy intel. They pray for the people enemy, they let God do the vengeance on the people enemy, but they cast out the demon enemy. And we can see how Jesus did that throughout the gospel, how he cast demons out. He didn't even let them speak. Just a few he let speak for our benefit. He asked the man or the spirit in the man, what's your name? And the man said, legion, because there are many of us. And so we could see how one man, one woman can have thousands of demons in them. That brings me to, uh, and, you, and you can look these things up. It's so easy to type it in Google. There was this woman who said she had, I can't remember how many thousands of personalities. I'm like, how in the world can she keep up? No wonder she's schizophrenic. Those are demons, legions of demons in her. 2 Corinthians 10 says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Stop fighting your children. Stop fighting your boss. Stop fighting your husband. Stop fighting your wife. Stop fighting your pastor. We do not war in the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We've got to rest in that truth. We totally walk away and ignore it. Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon, no weapon formed against me will prosper. It didn't say it won't be formed, but it says it won't prosper and we got to stand on it. It says, Cast down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Every thought, every idea, everything that you hear the media say that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, cast it down and bring it into a captivity to the obedience of Christ. There goes that word obedience and there goes to Christ. Bring it into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And then when you have learned to obey, when your obedience is fulfilled, 
He says, then revenge all disobedience. So number one, the people that God are going to use in this hour who recognizes his authority, his lordship, his greatness, and therefore obey him, number one, they don't go after vengeance. They let God do it. Number two, they recognize people aren't the enemy. It's the demons using the people. Christ died for the people. You pray for them. It's those demons that are in them that you cast down and cast out. And the third and final one, and this is a biggie, is authority awareness. Authority awareness. In other words, correct spiritual protocol. I remember um, the pastor, he's standing right here in front, in, in, in front here. He was looking at this little altar and he was disturbed that it was different to the way he had it. And he says, you don't go touching other people's altar. There's a protocol. There's a protocol in everything. Listen to this. This story in 1 Samuel 25, and this is the first time years and years ago I can see myself on my auntie's couch in New York. God taught me this lesson and we might be well to remember it because this is good that I'm getting a refresher on it. Now, Saul was after David for no reason except jealousy and demonic behavior. And so he's after David. David has done nothing but good to him. David killed Goliath, who had the army of Saul running. Saul didn't even go and Saul as the king didn't even face Goliath. But David did. And then when he had this evil spirit come over him, David played his harp and soothed him. So David was nothing but good and honorable to him, and all he wanted to do was kill David. First Samuel 25, 90, 11. And for some of you, the ones in authority over you, they're just afraid you'll take their place. Go pray for them, because God might want you to take their place. But he's not going to let you take their place when you're acting like them. But here's what David said when one of his mighty men, Abishai, said to him, let's kill him. Because David got Saul in a compromising position twice where he could kill Saul. Here's what David said. Do not destroy him. For who can stretch forth his hand against God's anointed and be guiltless? If you never get anything, get this. Who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And all of you who are getting on YouTube and talking about all these pastors, I mean, some of those pastors have caused thousands and thousands to come out of depression, have caused thousands of souls to turn to God, and you Take your finger and point at them. Point at God's anointed and run your mouth. You who've done nothing but make people feel disgusted because of your complaints. And these men and these women have caused souls. God will fix them if they're in air. How dare you stretch your hand out against God's anointed and do you think you're going to be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall de descend into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I 
should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. And it reminds me when my daughter was little. I didn't like anybody putting their mouth on my child. I didn't want her teachers to discipline her, because guess what? I did. They couldn't complain they had any trouble with my child. Because guess what? This mother disciplined her child. That was my job. I don't want you putting your hand on my child. Put your mouth on my child. I'll deal with it because she's mine. And that's how God feels about his anointed. They're mine. Wicked, but they're mine. I'll deal with them, not you. Jesus said something curious in Matthew 8, 8. A centurion came to him and asked him, come heal my servant and the lord says okay i'm coming and the centurion says no no in matthew 8 8 he said lord i'm not worthy that you should come under my roof but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed and this that he said next floored jesus he said I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go. And he goes, and lo to another, come. And he comes, and to my servant, do this. And he doeth it. And Jesus said, actually, it said Jesus marveled. In other words, he was an astonishment. He said, I have not found such great faith, no, in all of Israel. One man, what did Jesus see? He says, I am a man under authority. And I have people under me. And what I say to them, they have to do why? Because what he is told to do, guess what? He does. He understood the line of authority. And Jesus said, I've never seen anything like this. And he goes on to say something that we need to be careful of. He says, many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The children of the kingdom shall be cast out into utter darkness, and they shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because of disobedience. Because of disobedience, many will be cast out, and Jesus will say to them, Depart from me, you who work iniquity. I never knew you obedience recognizing authority recognizing the lines of authority i'm going to tell you something else i'm going to tell you something else and i want you to hear me when god says for us to vote for trump okay many didn't obey look what we've got now and i hope you're not burying your head in the sand and you're seeing that the enemy's coming after our children our children again that means god has deliverers he's raising up in those children and and the enemy he doesn't know who but he can sniff that something is happening he knows the senses of what's happening around him he lived in heaven he knows when heaven is gearing up for certain types of activities he can see from the portals of heaven what the angels scurrying around doing and he knows uh oh uh oh so he's after our children again and he's after Whatever God says, he does the opposite. God said, be fruitful and multiply. How are you going to be fruitful and multiply as a, tra a transgender? How are you going to be fruitful and multiply when two women 
come together sexually, when two men come together sexually, can you see the stupidity and the deception and the evil? And that's what's happened in the last three years. Laws have been enacted to say that these things are okay. And if we come against it, then we are going to go down as bigots. We are going to go down as evil. We are going to go down as intolerant. And so, yes, Trump did not lose the election. But why didn't God turn it around? i tell you why. You look at all the prophets who correctly prophesy that Trump will win, that Trump should win. Look back at a lot of them and hear what they said after. They spoke down about Biden. They said he was not a president. They called him names, authority. They lifted their hands. You see, the box of, think of the presidency as a box, right? I'm not talking about what's inside the box, but think of the presidency as a box. That box is God's anointed position. And you don't stretch your hand against it. Now, what's in it, he'll deal with. He will deal with it in time. Just like he said, in time, in time, he'll deal with it. But all the disrespect that came out of the mouths of the prophets, good godly men and women, all the things they said about Biden, you can pronounce judgment against the leader. You can, if God tells you to. But just to come out and call him names and and talk down, no, you don't do that. You don't do that. You don't disrespect the line of authority. Here's what Jude said about it. Jude, the book of Jude, it only has one chapter. So verse 8 says, likewise, also, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh Despise, they despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. Listen, listen to this. I'm coming to the end. If you go to a meeting in a room with dignitaries and Putin comes in, will you just stand up and rail on him? No, you won't. Because there's a certain attitude that you have to have in that room. Now, there are protocols set that can pull him out. But you can't just rise up and rail at him. You recognize the, the, the authority in the room of that dignitary. You don't do that. So he said these, these, the, so when, when we as people of God, when we as prophets start speaking evil against dignities, we put ourselves in this position to despise dominion, to be filthy dreamers. He says, even Michael the archangel, you got to understand who Michael the archangel is. Michael the archangel is like Joseph on the Pharaoh. God's got three archangels. One got kicked out of heaven, Lucifer. He's done. So there are two left, Michael and Gabriel. And he says, Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, disputing over the body of Moses, Michael the archangel is contending with a fallen archangel. He says, he didn't bring a railing accusation against this fallen angel. There's a time for that fallen angel to be cast out. He said, he just said, the Lord rebukes you. The Lord rebukes you. He said, these speak evil of those things which they know not. This is time for us to know. So I want to end again 
on this day of Pentecost to say this. The Lord is pouring out his spirit again on all flesh. And those who are positioned to hear the wind of the spirit, to see the directives, are those who recognizes God's greatness. They have that fear of the Lord. So they obey what he says to do. And they do not take vengeance upon themselves. They do not treat humans like enemy. Instead, they get rid of the demons. And third, they recognize authority. When you recognize authority, then your authority works. When you dismantle and despise authority, you're doing it to yourself as an authority of Jesus Christ. I want to end with Jude and say like he says in verse 20 Jude says you beloved you don't worry about all the evil around you about those who separate themselves from the spirit and are sensual. Or they may call themselves Christians. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the Lord. He says, you know, and Paul even says, if they call themselves Christians and they're fornicating, don't even eat with them. He says, with you, beloved, Jude chapter 1 verse 20, build yourselves up. Up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's why he came as a gift. He gave us a holy language. If you don't have it, ask for it. It's a free gift to all believers. Pray in that language. It's a language that the Holy Spirit prays through you. You become the one he's advocating for. You become the one he's speaking in place of. And as he speaks perfectly what you need, God knows what those things are and answers it. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Therefore, you love people. You love the homosexual community. Loving them means you don't despise them. You don't hit them. You don't hate them. You don't talk bad about them. Loving them means you tell them the truth. God loves you. He died for you to have a chance to go to heaven. He did because he loved you in your sin like he loved me in my sin. But if you don't turn away from homosexuality, if you don't turn away from straight sex outside of marriage, if you don't turn away from lying and cheating and stealing, you are going to go to hell. You're going to break God's heart, but he's doing everything he can and he's done everything he can to turn you away from the evil direction you're going in, following the devil, his perversion. Keep yourself in the love of God. He loves people. People are his. It's his right to judge them, not ours. When we judge, we judge according to the word, what the word says, and we do it how the word says. We don't put ourselves in the place of the Holy Spirit. We don't put ourselves in the place of God. Love people. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. If he didn't give me mercy, if he didn't give you mercy, you won't be going to heaven. You won't be. 
It's his mercy. So why do we not think that he can give that person over there mercy? That's what he wants. We're his advocates. That's why the Holy Spirit is on us. We're his ambassadors to tell that person, God loves you too much to let you stay in homosexuality. He loves you too much to cut off your penis. He loves you too much to sew up your vagina. He loves you too much to act like a woman when you're a freaking man. He loves you too much. He loves you too much. He died to prove it. He says, have compassion on some, making a difference. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Don't go in areas where you become spotted with the flesh and next thing you know, you're one of them. Don't do it. Don't do that. Paul says, I become all things to all men that I might win some, but he said, never outside the law of Christ. Never. So I'm going to end with this. Joe, Jude 24, unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power now and forever. Amen. That's the God we serve. We are not God. We are not gods. We are children of the Most High God, created in His image, filled with His Spirit to do His bidding. We're His servants, His slaves, His children, His ambassadors. Amen? So on this Pentecost day, may He fall fresh on you. May he give you new eyes to see. May he unpluck your ears. May the understanding of your heart be enlightened that you may see and understand whose you are and who he is. Amen. God bless you. Next Thursday, the 1st of June, and Sunday, the 4th of June, we will not be in the sanctuary. I have a death in the family. My aunt, my mommy's older sister, so I'll be off to New York. And so if I don't get a chance to do the messages live next Thursday and next Sunday, I'll make sure I prepare. I already have one. I'll make sure I prepare them and record them and send them out. 9, 9.30 on Sunday and 6 o'clock, no, 5 o'clock on Thursday. So we'll be back in the sanctuary Thursday, the 8th of June. God bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. And may you understand what that means, how deep that is, and the position that we hold as children of the Most High God, surrounded, filled with the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit filling us, surrounding us, but also a secret, high intel the best army, the greatest, most powerful army in the entire world surrounds us. Amen? God bless you. Lydia, I love you. Burra, God bless you. Peace. Peace to you. Aunt Eslyn, be encouraged. I'll talk with you all later. Bye-bye. Love you all. Kavalas, be blessed.